Hello friends of ACE, I hope we're all doing well. This has been Paul Clayton week this week. I was fortunate enough to speak to Paul and we've recorded this little interview for you. It's about an hour long, so sit back, enjoy, and I hope to speak to you all soon. Bye. I've got some questions just in terms of other different roles that you've done. Uh, but I think most of the people on the page will know you most for Mr. Colchester for the uh, Tortured Big Finish Series 5 and Series 6. Um, but straight away, sort of, we'll go in. There's what I thought there was such a varied array of different sort of roles that you've taken. But um, I was reading one of your old blog posts. This is going back to like 2013. Well, uh, well. Where you were saying that you can either do posh or northern or northern posh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my career, really. Uh, my mother, bless her, uh, we, I lost her last year at 98. And, um, but the one thing she did was when I was about 13, she insisted I went to elocution lessons uh, in Rotherham. And um, I went to a teacher whose greatest claim was that he said, one of my former pupils is on the television now, and his name is Brian Blessed and I thought oh my god I didn't know who Brian Blessed was but I we read poetry and we read Shakespeare and uh, all the vowel sounds that uh, are part of what was then called um, RP received pronunciation or standard English um, we worked on so that when I went to drama school and we were all learning that and had to do it um, I was a sort of step ahead and it became quite natural and for ages that's all I played nobody seemed to want to honor the 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 Yorkshire bit um, okay. and then eventually and the Yorkshire bit's very good for comedy and I love doing comedy yeah uh, and then there's that lovely middle line between you know like we've been watching Talking Heads again on the BBC and um I don't know who did it this year, but Martin Freeman certainly got his very right. Uh, that wonderful, you know, Pat Routledge, um, I don't like to be mithered. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, she said, do you want salt and pepper? I said, no, thank you. I'm not a big pepper fan. And the glory, I've got aunties who talk like that up in Yorkshire and um, bless them. And that aspiration, uh, my mother would always put a telephone you know we have one telephone in the middle of the house on a japanese table a big black baker like thing which when it rang the house stopped and somebody <laughs> would approach it and my mother would i'm pretty sure she dusted her hands on her apron then would pick it up and hello rather than eight five oh two five oh and she, oh it's you muriel right <laughs> so yes that's bleeded into my acting and um some people don't know that I'm from Yorkshire and are very surprised when I they find out I am. And people who know me just go, how do you get away with doing posh all the time? <laughs> the two things never seem to mix. No, no, no. But, you know, I think the thing for all of us in this business, and particularly in things with within the audio world, is that you have to have something to hang what you do on. There are lots yeah. of really good actors. And I meet lots of really good actors. I was chairman of the Actors Centre for 10 years and mentored a lot of really good up and coming actors. And they get, oh, how do you get into audio drama? And I go, you're great. Your acting's fantastic. You're... But what is the hook? Uh, and I didn't know what it was, but Scott did for me. Yeah. So when they rang up, well, he emailed me one Sunday afternoon and then we had a conversation. He said, we're looking at this new series of, Tor of Torchwood and about which I knew very little. Uh, and he said, there's a character called Mr. Colchester and I cannot get your voice out of my head. And I went, um, right, okay. But um, it's what you do with that. There's a distinctiveness about it and people are very kind about it. I probably don't really know what it is. I just do it and get on with it. It works, that's all that matters. <laughs> Yeah, because I was reading up about that. Um, so Mr. Colchester was a, an original idea from Russell T. Davis to yeah. sort of counteract I that of Russell, Thailand. Russell had marked him down as Scottish. Yes, so that was it. It was He said Scottish, but then 
Scott turned around and said, well, hang on a minute, what about Paul? So the fact that they sort of changed that part of the character to fit you must be a massive compliment. Uh, it's good. I, I'm glad I didn't know that for ages because I would have felt um, very, uh, I think I would have felt the pressure. Um, yeah. And I, I had to confess, I hadn't really ever watched Tortured. I'd been a Doctor Who fan for a long time, thrilled when it came back, um, loved it. I sat, uh, I remember one night, I think during David Tennant, I did a David Tennant episode, but I remember during a, a David Tennant series, we were at my partner's nephew's, and my partner, who's about 20 years younger than me, and his nephew, who is a good 25 years younger than him, and the three of us all sat on the sofa, side by side, absolutely gripped by the same program. Yeah. Which was just the way I was gripped with it, with William Hartnell in the, in the 60s when it started. Yeah. So I was aware of the legacy and I knew what had happened with Torchwood and the story of it. But to come into it, um, I thought, um, right, but I've always, had a, I've always had a brilliant time at Big Finish. Yeah. Uh, their stories are good. And I believe the way of telling stories in audio is probably as pure as it gets because it requires such a brilliant commitment from you uh from the listener um and they become part of the story they create the pictures they they fill the details in they do the fine coloring we just do sort of the bold strokes really yeah. um, it was a great pleasure to say yes but i'm very thrilled that i once played a scottish dentist in the children's television program and i think that alone was probably reason for immediate independence <laughs> from Scotland. <laughs> what was it like, um, so coming into Torchwood, was it, um, was it more of a relief um, that there was already sort of John and Eve still there from the surviving sort of TV cast? Was that a good thing to lean on or was it more sort of daunting the fact they were there? Um, it wasn't daunting because I have never done a Torchwood session with John Barrowman in the studio. Oh, okay. Uh, I did an, I guested, uh, played a rather recalcitrant robot recently in a, in a Captain Jack yes. event with him and Camille Kaduri, which was great fun. And we met and Camille and I did a television series called Him and Her Together. Uh, and we were, John and I were joshing about the studio and Camille went, oh, of course you two know each other, you've done so much. And John went, no, we haven't done anything. We've never met. <laughs> um, uh, it's always very funny when I have big scenes with them um, with Jack that I think you know we don't this that's the magic of um, Scott Hancock um, so when I came in I came to Cardiff for my first afternoon and I've been promised I didn't have to come to Cardiff very often uh, but I liked Cardiff and um, we were nicely looked after and it was just me and Johnny and Alex Alexandria and I recorded a little bit for a sort of uh, montage thing. And then we did the scenes from, I think, just one episode between uh, Tyler and Eng, Eng or Nonji or whatever you want to call her, and, um, and me. And um, we were all nervy. And then we did the chat about being together. And then we went down to the harbour the bay yeah and some photographs took which i only saw recently oh okay uh, and we look like some we look like the second place winners on x factor <laughs> uh, we've all got our collars turned up against the yeah wall, trying to look mysterious i mean johnny you know johnny doesn't have a problem with a camera <laughs> but um we do look like sort of you know don't take that or whatever yeah <laughs> I was going to ask, because uh, we first obviously met Mr. Colchester in the, it was the 10th anniversary sort of yeah. special called the Torch and Archive. So that yeah. was the first time that we saw him. Was that, so that was all filmed on the same, because I wasn't sure if there was a gap between that and then you finding out that you would then be a series regular later on. No, I think they decided that. So we were already starting that next series, but they retrospectively wanted to put him back into the Torchwood archives so and I have to say I, I I just did those scenes blind yeah which the joy for actors of radio that you don't have to have prepped and made a lot of choices 
uh, and you can make those choices quite immediately in the studio and off the back of what the other actors are doing and off the guidance that you're getting from a good director. But um, it, it was a little strange because I, um, I didn't really, and I knew his history. Um, I knew sort of where he'd come from, um, but not a lot about him because a lot of things that they, that we now know about him, I think, have, have, have been developed over the box sets that have yeah. been great. Yeah, because I think it was only by sort of story six that we even found out his first name, I think. From oh, the yes. No, I mean, it was almost as well hidden as Inspector Morse. <laughs> so I know. I, I, I would quite happy have gone on being Colchester or Mr. Colchester, but um, they did feel that the reason... I think because they were going to have a problem when they decided to um, bring in more of Colin. Yeah. If at home he called me Mr. Colchester, <laughs> or oh, I love you, Mr. Colchester. <laughs> um, I love you, Colchester. Uh, but um, I think we had to find out what his name, and I didn't know till I got that script. Oh, wow. Uh, and then you just do it, and I am. Um, I like. I quite like St. John Colchester. I don't know if it's what I'd have chosen, but then again, we don't get to choose our names in life. We only get no. to change for equity. So, <laughs> well, it was very similar. So your first dealing sort of with Doctor Who that was Auto Audio. That was the animated with David and Freema, um, and you were Ulysses Murgrass. So I think. I I was. I did actually do a big finish years before that with Colin Baker and with Maria McCurlane. And I can't remember what it's called, but I did play Henry and she played Henriette. And it was about, a, we were doing something rotten with time and I didn't really understand it. Um, <laughs> but then Mayor Grouse was great fun. Uh, he's a slug and he's an arms dealer. Yeah. Uh, and I love, I loved it when I got to see the pictures eventually. We weren't shown the pictures at the recording. Oh, okay. uh, and we did that up in Kilburn where we do quite a lot of um, uh, Torchwood. Um, and I did it on a Saturday afternoon. They're very good with their scheduling, so you do it quite quickly. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, when I saw the cartoon, I thought, oh, that's fab. And actually doing that... Uh, I think sparked interest in me going to Cardiff to do um, Doctor Who. Yeah. To protect the Who. Uh, which, of course, is every, if you watched it, you know, I'm, I must yeah. have been six or seven when I started watching it. So to go and do it is, is your little boy's dream come true. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I still remember sort of vividly when it came back in 2005. Uh, I knew nothing about it. I was nine at the time, and it was my mm. nan and my granddad. Uh, that turned around and said, oh, I think you like this. We used to watch this. Uh, John Pertwee used to be on it. Um, and it was that one moment that I was like, it's, it's a weird to pinpoint a moment where everything seems to change. And ever since then, Doctor Who's just always had this sort of running theme throughout everything that I've chosen. That's it's the reason I'm in Cardiff when I came to uni, was because Doctor Who's here. It's, it's a surreal effect that it has on people. Um, so it's nice to see people that did watch it and then now actually are sort of invested in it in some way or another. Um, what was it like getting the call when it was? Uh, well, it took ages. I can't remember why. And I thought they'd forgotten. And then um, it was, you know, a lot of the time these days, they don't tell you about it being a no. They only tell you about it being a yes. So you wait at home. And then probably the most times you realise you didn't get the job is when you're watching the programme and you see somebody else playing what you were reading. For. Ah, right. <laughs> I think I'd sort of written it off and then my agent rang and said they want you to do Doctor Who. Sorry they've taken so long but they've been having and it was like would you do next week and there's a read through and quite often you don't go to the read through if you're doing a couple of scenes or something and mm. it's an extra day and whatever and but it was Doctor Who and I wanted to go to the read through so I did go to the read through. Uh, I think it was the first read through it was the first two episodes that were shot of the series where Catherine Tate came in for yes. time. Yeah. So there was a lot of fuss about that. And 
but David was charming. David Tennant is a great company leader and said hello. And then all I remember is that he came and apologized that he wouldn't be there when I was filming. And, oh. But he said, would you, he just said, would you like to have a look? Uh, and I said, yeah. And I thought, I know what he's talking about. And we went outside the read through room and we went into a piece of black curtain just hanging there rather tatty. And we stepped through the black curtain and um, we were in the TARDIS. Oh, wow. And it was um, <laughs> magic and exciting. And um, you just wanted to run around and pull switches yeah. and be a bit Patrick Trout esque, you know. And, oh, quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It was bliss and um, it was uh, is what it's all about and you think how fabulous you know that uh, this is still going on that started with a lot of egg boxes on black and white television in, in 1963 and I remember being very frightened by some episodes uh, and I remember finding some characters probably didn't know but you know very sexy so yeah. Um, I liked all that. My, um, are you off out? Yeah. Okay. Bye. I'm just doing an interview. Um, yeah. So I think that was the, the key moment of going back in and going, this is magical. And I'm in it for about three minutes and then I get killed off because I'm very naughty to an ood. Yeah. Rude to an ood, I think <laughs> is the motto. Um, but in enormous fun. And at that time, of course, as David had started doing it, I think at its height, yeah. you know, after, after uh, Chris's first series and then in David's first and second, I think that's David's second series, I'm not sure. but um, uh, it's His third series. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Well, then really at his height, the nation was yeah. watching, you know, and, and everybody but everybody just wanted to be in it. Um, yeah. I was lucky enough to be asked. Yeah, and you got a trading card out of it as well. I did. A yeah. top trumps. Um, yeah, I got a top trumps out of it. And um, <laughs> other actors I've worked with and know don't have as many points in certain areas as I well. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. It always comes down to this. I, I know. I think Mr. Colchester would have a lot of points on his Oh, definitely. Card. We need to, I need to pitch that to Scott then. We need to get a, a torch with top trumps set. Well, there's so there. many boxes that are ticked. I mean, apart from the military thing and the background and the no-nonsense, and he's gay, and then we find out in that wonderful scene quite early on that he's got a Muslim husband. Yeah. Um, box ticking, but it's brilliantly <laughs> done. Yeah. None of it's done sort of to push a storyline which i like that's what i like about sort of these characters in specific they're all very much they've got these things going on in their life but none of it's part of an agenda none of it's part to push it. it's just who they are mm -hmm. and i think that's why the team works so well because obviously you've got uh mr colchester and tyler both gay but different ages so they bounce off each other in such a way that We've probably not really seen before when it comes to sort of torture and Doctor Who. No, we've had some brilliant scenes together, and yeah. I think you're. And I love the fact that um, he he's just gay. The older man is just gay, uh, and a, a big fuss isn't made about it, um, but that it isn't thrown away. It no. is part of him, and. Um, the emotional stuff and that's why I was very glad when I realized we were going to meet Colin and then Colin was going to have a uh, a part in it um, so to me as a gay man I'm not you know I don't go out and find roles to be gay I, I am that in my life it's like, yeah. like you know this is I don't believe in it gay as an adjective um, mm. It's a very gay sofa. It's a sofa. You know? Yeah. There was somebody this morning who was irritating my Yorkshire side who kept saying, I've been talking to Northern leaders and about the Northern trains. And you go, they're not <laughs> Northern leaders. They're leaders and they are trains. Yeah. You happen to be in the North. And I and uh, my partner are men and we happen to be gay. It's not a, a label. 
and that's what I loved about, uh, oh, it's not more gay characters. It's just he was brought in because they wanted that character and they went down that route. And, yeah. uh, and the fact that, um, you know, we're at Colchester, there are two gay characters and one's played by a gay actor and one's played by a, a straight actor or whatever. Um, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, because I, I think in the same sort of blog post before, you were saying that sort of you want to bring that sort of truth to your roles um, and you want to sort of put yourself in it. Because I think at that point, uh, I think you'd just done Hollyoaks uh, as the oh, yes, my famous, um, yeah, Superintendent Marlowe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, I've written a book, uh, a novel, which came out just before Christmas called The Punishment, which has... Uh, as its protagonist, a gay actor who's an ex-soap star. And um, it's based on an incident that sort of happened to me in my early 20s. And it's, I, in the novel, the character takes the option I didn't take, which turns into quite a criminal escapade. Um, but the soap in the novel that he goes back into to do a live broadcast, um, I don't think anybody who watches soap will have a problem working out which one it's supposed to be. Um, and I, yeah, uh, it's really, I just, you do bring some of yourself to roles. You have to, that's what we have. That's what yeah. makes it different. I don't believe that, you know, there will always be a bit of me. And actually, if I'm doing it well, people should look at it and be able to say, oh, that's just like you. Yeah. Uh, but it's a facet of me. There's a facet of me that's grumpy and right wing. Uh, there's a facet of me that's quite quiet and a good listener. Um, there's a facet of me that's very camp and northern. Um, there's a facet of me, I think, that's a little bit frightening that some people find a bit um, intimidating. And it's like you refocus the lens. Yeah. Um, and there's a facet of me which is me, which is gay. I've been, I always call myself very lucky that I didn't have to go through some Damascene moment of working out what I was. Um, it, it, it seemed to happen in some way at a very young age. Um, and I didn't get bullied. I got I don't know, by today's criteria in the 1960s at a grammar school, people might call it bullying. I just called it, I was the the spotlight of attention. Mm. Um, but if you could turn that into good humour, you know, I never got hit. Nobody ever hit me or chastised me. It was just fun. I had a nickname at school, which was quite fun and not derogatory and made me a key player in in the school society um, yeah. so doing gay roles is never a problem as long as i feel it's not just about the fact that it's just about the fact they're gay that yeah a long does yeah. that make sense yeah no definitely because that sort of i was going to mention the um because you came back again so quite a lot of doctor who fans uh will also probably be watching Holby City as well. Uh, ah, there's quite well, a few very, people that sort yeah. of cross over with that. And uh, you were in one, but then you came back as well. I've been back three times now. And yeah. I think, I, I don't know what will happen now, but the last time I um, did one, which would have, so I recorded it in, Uh, it was just shown at the beginning of lockdown. So I think I recorded it before Christmas and then it was delayed a week. It was when things yeah, started. They went to yeah. yeah. And that was about a new, a different character who'd come in who didn't know whether he was gay or not. So they hawked Roger out of the cupboard to give him the Roger treatment. And <laughs> both been involved in the Admiral Duncan um, bombing. And it was beautifully sensitively written. Yes, uh, yeah. I, I just love the idea that the originally he was supposed to be older in his 70s and then one of the casting directors said why not ask Paul to come in and I went and talked to them and um, and I'm very happy if, um, if, if that's what he is and a lot of people go like he's an older version of Dominic and I think Dominic's a great role, role yes. for David yeah. um, so I think if people 
particularly young gay people can see that actually it's possible to be fit to get to 50 or 60 and be gay and um content yeah is the word then i think that's a good i think that's a good thing and also he's still um naughty and um <laughs> and a bit wicked yeah definitely <laughs> When it comes to sort of being content and things like that, just sort of going back to Mr. Colchester, sort of some of the highlights actually from the box sets from a personal perspective are the ones where you and Colin get more time together. Um, so the escape room episode is one of the ones that always comes to mind. Because um, that's two pairs. I think that's, is that even Kai with the two of you in that one? Yeah, I'm paired up with Kai, aren't I? Yeah. I'm with Alex. With yeah, with Alex, yeah, playing Gwen, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm very glad they brought Colin in, and I'm more, even more extremely glad that they cast Ramon, because uh, I used to be a big fan of this life, and the sight of uh, Ferdy arriving every week in his motorbiking letters, and... <laughs> leathers and and screwing somebody was always a highlight <laughs> and then he's a very handsome man in his 50s i think now i don't know yeah um, but he's gorgeous to work with and um we are in booths side by side and those scenes are really nice to play yeah because it's about something different than running around and dealing with Yvonne Hartman and <laughs> but Adrian Threat has come along. It's just about two people who are I don't know, when you a friend of mine said this recently and it, it struck a chord. She said, you know when you've met the right person because you look at them and you know they're a better person than you are. And I think that's true of Colchester with Colin. And no matter what Colchester is, he thinks that Colin is a better person than he is. And it's why he values him and, um, and, and why he will take such risks and things. And I think it's, um, I think that's very true. And also the writers who've come up with those scenes um, are, are rather good at creating something. I think we've had to take out, you need to speak to James Goss. <laughs> <laughs> it might be the word honey was in there. And yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> they have never called a man who I've either shagged, loved, or just talked to. I don't think I've ever said honey, and I don't intend to base a relationship on saying it. Um, but in the main, they've written really lovely scenes about two people yeah. who, who, who love each other. Yeah, no, definitely. Because there's, um, I think it's the one where you're in the hotel and that's the real sort of standout, just the pair of them together, sort of. And it's, there's the alien threat surrounding them with everything that's going on in the hotel, but it, predominantly just the two of you it's such a standout performance from from both sides um and it it just all feels so real between the two of them it really does um, it's nice to explore it's just really nice to explore i mean the alien threats are our our working life there are kpis our performance indicators yeah. whatever uh, but the emotional side is not necessarily what you would um expect and I no. think that adds such detail and joy to those stories yeah and he's he's been on a bit of a ride as well so I think it was at the end of Aliens Among Us uh, and then uh, the beginning of God Among Us when we get Jacqueline King come in as God uh, and you get resurrected now not many not oh, many, yes, not many characters get that <laughs> yeah, my funeral I listened to my own funeral <laughs> what was that like it's good. I don't mind. I don't mind's as good as that. <laughs> Bloody hell, I'm going to start leaving instructions. Um, uh, it's strange because I did it and then I got and there was all this thing and then they were all teasing me and I said, 
you can't have asked me to do this and then you killed me off. Um, I went into Coronation Street, oh God, 2012. And in 2007, I, did, I went through a whole process for Coronation Street, which, it, you know, it's a Northern program. So of course yeah. I loved it. And it was between me and somebody else and he had a bigger profile, but we got right down to screen tests and everything and they went the other way. And unfortunately they killed off that character because it didn't work out with that actor. And oh. every, a lot of people were going, it's written for you. And then I went in 2012 and the phone rang and would you come and be so and so so so? And I went in and yep, we started and uh, this is going to be great. And then they killed me off in about two months and lots of people very kindly uh, were going, yeah, this is such a waste. We've waited to get him and all this. And anyway, um, so when I had, had such enjoyment doing the first lot of to um, Torchwood and then Mr. Colchester was the cliffhanger. Yeah. And I thought, and I kept saying, this, and Scott and people, oh, you know. <laughs> Did somebody say, am I recording? Um, and then I think they did start recording without me. Uh, but then, because I think it's my funeral and then I miss an episode and then I come back when Jack's in the flat with Colin. Yeah. Uh, so it's brilliantly done. It's really, really well done uh, bringing me back. Um, but for any actor, it's a tense time when you think, we've just got this lovely man, we've just got him right. And they're, you know, these gods of producing <laughs> pissing around for ratings. But there were lots of lovely tweets from people. So thank you. Yes. If you tweeted. Yeah, no, definitely. And all of you who are tweeting for Mr. Colchester to have an adventure on his own, um, please, we don't know what's happening. They've all rushed out of Cardiff in that car. Yeah. Um, we're being told that other things are planned, but we don't know anything. Uh, perhaps I got in a car on my own. Oh, I don't that, know. that would be good. I think when I announced, um, well, I've not, so I'm trying to keep sort of each week a bit secret, uh, but mm -hmm. every now and then I'll sort of message people just for a few feelers just to say, oh, have you got any suggestions? Have you got anybody who you'd like me to do a week on? And Mr. Colchester has come up <laughs> quite a few several times uh, when yeah. I've asked people. Um, and I think definitely this next week sort of going through sort of his favorite moments another one of mine uh, is the scrape jane episode that oh, one i love it i but that get scared when i listen to it because i did scrape jane on my own in the studio i only met alex wasn't there at all i met the actress and i please forgive me because i can't remember her name who came in to play the woman we go and talk to and in the afternoon two young guys, one of whom went on to win the Carlton Hobbs Radio Prize from the Royal Wales College came in to record some other bit. But the wow. rest of the day, the whole of Scrape Jane, I did on my own with Scott reading in the, from the control room. So there was no perception to me of how um, scary it would be. Yeah, oh, sorry, I'm just having a look now with the, um, I've got them all to hand. <laughs> ah, very good. Uh, this has got a, a cast in it. Um, she came in and, and, and we started off in the morning with her and that was about an hour. And then the rest of the day was a very, very long day. Just being yeah. on my um, And I think that's it. Sam Bert arrived in the evening to have dinner and do some stuff together the next day. And then I was going back to London because I was filming something else. Um, so that box set, I didn't really meet anybody on other oh, wow. than two soldiers and uh, whoever played Scrape Jane. Um, but I loved it. I loved it. The, the writers are so clever. You know, I love that one with, um, oh, sorry. I've got that's to, okay. I'm going to this speaker that seems to be calling out to be connected. Um, the other one I love is the one with the sort of Amazon delivery firm, except of course it's not Amazon. Yes. <laughs> but with the firm, you know, and the targets and... <clears throat> yeah. So feasible. I'm going to duck out of shot. It's okay. For one second. 
Uh, yeah, and you read the stories and you're fascinated by them and you go, that's so plausible. Yeah, yeah, there's some of them that are a lot harder hitting than you expect from A, being from Torchwood, but then also with it being audio as well and you've not got the visuals and you're making that up yourself. It's... No, no, I don't know which one um, it's called, but the one that Johnny did where Tyler was homeless. Yes, yeah, that was the one that was in my head, sort yeah. of. It's he's brilliant. It's heart wrenching. Through that he was one. brilliant. I don't. I I think I only appear in a scene or something. So I'd done them independently, and I hadn't done them with him, uh, which is a shame because when Johnny and I are in the studio, <laughs> we do tend to have fun and we have a, a we have a laugh. Yeah. And famously, there is a tape. Evidently, I would. Uh, there's a tape of farts. Uh, and Scott Hancock evidently has it. I yeah. think he's probably not going to part with it for a great deal of money. <laughs> I am not the only person on that tape whose effluence has been recorded. Um, but it did happen doing a scene with Johnny. And Johnny had, well, you would have thought that Johnny had never heard a fart before in his life. <laughs> uh, we were in separate booths, but we got to a pause and you know, middle of the afternoon, you've had a couple of cups of coffee and tea and a custard cream, and it has to go somewhere. And yeah. um, I let rip, and uh, Johnny was absolutely unusable for about half an hour. <laughs> the inexperience, you see, of young, they don't know that when you get to a certain age, farting's just part of walking, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to put in a, a pledge to Scott. Maybe we'll yeah <laughs> we'll get that <laughs> relief. Jump it in from a sound effects record, you know, yeah. where all sound like men sitting on whoopee cushions. Yeah, well, big finish are doing vinyls now, so maybe we can get a we can get a press. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, there's there's a couple of them. There's no, I don't believe there's any tortured ones yet, but sort of the David Tennant range, and then there's sort of uh, a few Tom Bakers and things like that are all coming out onto vinyls. <laughs> Um, I mean, I do love the I do love the downloads, and I've got them all because they just get straight to my phone, and I can use yeah. them or whatever. But I have to say, I am very proud that my bookshelf has all the box sets for, for Torchwood, and um, and what else have I got? I've got Dorian Gray, and I've got some Doctor Who, and I've got um, oh, and I've got Cicero, which I just think is masterful. Yeah, another Scott job. So was it? Uh, was it doing Dorian Gray that you first met Scott? Is that how that came about, or did you? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it is. I think that was it. And in Dorian Gray, I am Scottish. Oh. <laughs> I am the owner of the department store where very odd things are taking place in the basement. Um, and I remember doing that on a Sunday with Alex Laos, and I just did half a day, and that was a direct offer. Scott just, my agents rang up and said, and then, so yeah, I met Scott, and I, uh, he was great. And, and, and the worst thing was, I went in thinking, okay, he's Scottish, let's do this. Let's, yeah. I don't know how good my Scottish is, and I can really only do that slightly. Um, pernickety Edinburgh morning say <laughs> and I did it and then I came out for lunch and the writer came out of the control room and the writer came out and went right it's really good to meet you Paul how are you doing what are you doing man? and I said fuck <laughs> I said thank you so much for not telling me the writer was Scottish and sitting in the control room um, yeah and um, that and then Torchwood and then a few guest bits. I've done a War Master, I think. Yes, yeah. Um, but and then going in for, I knew they were doing Cicero because a young guy plays his brother, who I mentored from the Alan Bates, George Namer, and um, and then to go in and 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 play Sulla, which again we did in a an, an afternoon or a day, I think, and we just did all Sulla's scenes. Yeah. Without context, really, but they're brilliantly written. And then to listen to it back, um, which is, uh, it's fantastic. Sam Barnett is just 
beyond brilliant in, yeah. in his energy and how he makes it so clear and um because i've read those robert harris cicero books and i love them and um the stories are fab so that was that was a real you know i loved i loved being in that and i did very little and and get quite an amount of prominence yeah i think that one's actually been quite a sort of well received box set as well because they um scott's now doing pieces with peter davison in the fifth doctor era and i do believe there is actually a box set or a story that had got sam barnett coming in as cicero meeting then the fifth doctor as well uh yeah yeah so I, I think I've, it's I've seen been, that on new yeah that's really good yeah so i think that's another box set that scott's done really well with well, I love Sam. We having Norton Folgate join us for the last series was well, yeah. a lot of hysterics because um, uh, there's quite a lot of twinkle in Norton Folgate. Yeah, uh, and there's a lot of twinkle. Uh, you won't mind me saying it because he's the most divine actor. But there's a lot of twinkle in Mr. Barnett as well. Um, and I just I give up and I just laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was that was another one, sort of another standout. Um, speaking of Sam, was the body swap story? Oh, because uh, then you swapped with John for that one. Yeah. What was that like? I, think, I don't think ours <laughs> was the most successful. I don't know. All I could think of was John in pantomime. <laughs> Hello, boys and girls. Well, here I am. I'm John Barrowman, and 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 he has that phenomenal energy, uh, and that's all I could think of to latch onto. I think Johnny and Sam swap yeah. was brilliant, but they were in the studio together to do it, oh, okay. whereas I was on my own, having to be Barrowman, and Mr. Barrowman was on his own, having to be me. Um, I think the stories. Uh, very funny. How anybody works their way through it at the first time of listening, <laughs> I don't know as to who, because when we were, that's where the brilliance of Scott Hancock comes in, because he, uh, and in this, you are being, but you are John, and okay, right, because otherwise there's no, no, you know, I think even you... colour highlighter pens didn't work. <laughs> yeah, I think you need somebody sort of as strong as Scott to sort of give that direction when it comes to the tricky things like that definitely <laughs> um and finally sort of with sort of that sort of leads on quite nicely in terms of comedy's always been sort of a thing that you've sort of is that something you're drawn to or just something that you've been picked it's for like, it's a bit like instant sugar lumps isn't it really it's great doing a big tragedy and then everybody claps at the end um but with comedy the instant sugar lump of the laugh and also uh having directed a lot in the theater um the 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 construction of what gets the laugh um really interests me um and i like um I just like that thing. I think there's a lot of, I think, laughter of recognition and, la and laughter of acknowledgement are great things. When I, um, when I wrote the book, uh, it was a crime book. I love whodunits and crime and thrillers. And um, I was advised, don't do funny. Not in this genre. Don't do funny. And I thought, I can't, n I can't not do funny, but uh, I, I need to be funny, it's part of me, but uh, the good thing about it is people, the reviews for it are that it is funny, it does make people laugh out loud in places, but it is very dark and yeah. it does make people turn the pages. Uh, somebody I know messaged me yesterday to say, I really hate you because I was going to read this for 15 minutes in bed last night and I'm halfway through and I still don't <laughs> And I went... That's that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to be that sort of book. Um, but it had to me to be uh it had to me to be amusing. And uh that's what I like about the writers and what they've been encouraged to do with Colchester. Yeah. That um there is a very dry wit. Um he doesn't 
I say people, there's that saying, you don't suffer fools gladly. Um, I don't think he suffers fools. Mm. Um, and when that's there, it's great fun to play. Yeah. Do you get much sort of, obviously sort of you get the scripts and the direction, things like that. Is there much that you then as yourself can put into that or is it just i think some i think the most effect we very rarely change lines scott's fantastically supportive of writers and i think uh, as actors we should be and yeah uh, young actors who perhaps on a soap opera i don't know but um you know there are instances where people go oh i don't think she'd say this she'd say this and normally it's because it's easier to say and to me that's never the case it's always why does he say this? Why does he say it in this way? I have a kids charity called Grimm and Co that I'm patron of and they write stories and plays and films and when we give those scripts to actors we did one at the beginning of lockdown and, and, and lots of lovely people like Olivia Coleman and Gary Oldman read kids poetry um, for us uh, and I say you can't change a word you've got to find the justification as to why the child has used those words and when that's dialogue, that's really interesting. Um, and I think if we can do that with nine-year-olds, we can do it with very clever 39-year-olds. Yeah. <laughs> as actors, we are not, most of the time, we're not creative artists, we're interpretive artists. And we are taking somebody else's work and interpreting it. So to me, the biggest weapons I have are probably the pause, which can undermine a line or can undermine something and you can break a line in a particular way and find, you know, the difference between saying, uh, let me think of an example. Um, yes, Tyler, that's a very good idea. Or you decide to be, yes, Tyler, that's a very good idea and you can flip it and turn yeah. it and they can choose to go with your interpretation or not uh, and that to me is our job um uh, heaven for fend at any point i mean i've done impro and it's great fun and i was in an impro who done it in the west end for six months about 20 years ago where we wow. improvised 50 minutes of it every night around a set framework so the audience could work out who'd done it and it's great fun but uh, I think the discipline of scripted work uh, calls on your interpretive talents and to take it into your own vocabulary and mm. that's what that's what makes me um, the the doing him and her written by Stefan Golachevsky and in fact Peep Show I've got to be very nice because I'm watching Succession at the moment which is Jesse Armstrong's brilliant series yeah. Uh, and but Jesse and Sam, uh, the dialogue in Peep Show was very sparse for the rest of us, uh, which is brilliant because there's no need to rush it and actually no need to do much with it to get the humour. And similarly, mm -hmm. in him and her, Stefan would write you something, you know, like, I'm parked near the door, I've got a blue badge. <laughs> um, and it's funny. Yeah. You don't need to work out how it's a gag. And that's the sort of thing I love. And when that turns up, and we're given the ability to do that with those scripts. And of course, in, in Torchwood and Big Finish, we've just got the words, brilliant words, mm. but we've just got the words. Yeah, well, we're, I think we're all praying that we'll get another series. Um, I know we're so all praying. Obviously, I need another world cruise, which is what we do when we see from Big Finish. Uh, as soon as I know I'm doing half an episode, I'm booking a return first class to Sydney. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that it's definitely, Torchwood is sort of the biggest sort of big finish set that I've got. Um, but it would definitely be nice if the, the monthly range and things like that then started delving possibly into either what Mr. Colchester was doing before all this started or what's going to happen next i think well if it was before i might have to be all military and get it right yeah. rather good but i think yeah i'm intrigued i mean i i am intrigued to know what's happened and where they're going and i know they've got something in their mind and 
possibly there are either ideas for scripts or scripts. Uh, I've done one something for, I can't even tell you what it's for because I don't know. I, did it <laughs> I have a very, we have a walk-in wardrobe, which I use as my studio. So I've done two series for American cable television in my wardrobe. I've oh, done wow. a computer game and right at the beginning, I had two hours in there with Scott on my phone and recording into my Mac. Um, and it is something for a doctor, but I don't know which one. Um, well, that's something to look out for. Yeah, what was it like? Yeah, because so it was the robot that was in the Captain Jack story. Yes, well, that robot's Alan Bennett, really, but he's just wonderful. <laughs> it's all those Victoria Wood, and they just let me you know. So on the day, it's um, it's very much. Um, uh, if you'd like to take your seats, we'll be departing for planet whatever in a few moments. We'd rather not have any interference, as this might result in an adventure of the sort we might not be able to contain. <laughs> and then they've done a brilliant job of electrophonicifying him. And um, so the tone of Alan Bennett is kept, but uh, he's a rather nasty piece of work. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It made me laugh, that script, a lot. Yeah, no, that's definitely, because I'm a big Camille fan myself. Uh, so yeah. anything that she's in, straight away, put it in my basket, sorted. Uh, but I think I remember tweeting you on the day, because um, you didn't really cross paths that much when you were in Him and Her. Was it just... Uh, well, no, except that because Him and Her was done a bit like those five episodes, like a film. Yeah. Um, we were all there at this house in St Albans for seven weeks, um, sitting around, and we shot two episodes as big long takes. So episode two and episode, no, episode three and episode four, um, the ceremony and the speeches, yeah, were shot as twenty-four minute takes. Oh wow! And, and they just shot it a lot of time from a lot of different angles. But we did the whole of the ceremony and the whole of the speeches each time. Um, so we were all around each other a lot, which was great because it felt like a company and we could all sit and tell stories and share sandwiches and things. Yeah. But yeah, we did have very um, Graham and um, and I can't remember Camille's character name, but Camille and Paul uh, came in contact, but Graham and Camille's character didn't very much. No. But she's lovely. Yeah, she's she's a delight. I think I've probably annoyed her too much the amount of times that I've made a met her at Comic Cons and things like that. <laughs> um, is that something that you've ever been asked to do, like Comic Cons and things like that? Or I haven't been asked. Um, uh, I, there was one at the end of last year that we it was talked about whether we would go the new Torchwood team, and then. Okay didn't organise. I would happily go, and I I did do a Doctor Who um tenth planet i think it was yeah um saturday morning uh once as mr bartle um to do photos and and chat uh because a good friend of mine is alex kingston and um i think they've been i don't know why but um i think that series had just finished so they were getting a lot of people from that series so that was just mm. one I'd, I'd happily go and do one because I think they'd be interesting. I don't know what they're. I've heard what they're like. Yeah, I don't know what they're like. So it would be good fun. Yeah. So we, we they, there is a big finish day each year. Um, I was lucky enough to be the photographer at the last one. Uh, but yeah, at the end of last year, it got sort of. No, it was this year. Uh, obviously, everything's been postponed now. Um, yeah. But they're they're doing a digital one this year, which would be exciting. Um, but yeah, I think no, there's definitely one planned for next year. So we'll have to. I'm just going to have to keep making petitions. We just need more Mr. Yeah. Colchester in more talks. Mr. Colchester. Um, and we need you at Big Finish Day. I think that's... Well, that would be brilliant. Yeah, I'll, I'll get right on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that's it for everything that I've got. Unless there's anything that you'd um, want to talk about. Um, no, it's been great chatting. Yeah, thank you for this. It's It's been exciting. Um, first ever interview ever done. <laughs> 
<laughs> Good, and you've done very well. But I just think it's great, and I think it's a great target um, audience. And I think that um, if things that in life, such as one's sexuality or coming to terms with it, that can be problematic for people, um, can be shared through a shared love of something else, mm -hmm. a particular story or fiction, um, I think that's all to the good. Um, you know, they're both passions, aren't they, ultimately? Yes, yeah. Um, and I think if we can share them and talk them and, and feel that we're with people who are like-minded and understand, um, then I think that's a good thing. Yeah, and I think it is a, it's a credit to yourselves that are on screen, that are sort of audio, that are behind the scenes, that the stories that you help tell us are the things that give us our safe havens. And they're the things, especially sort of from a personal perspective, when things got tough growing up, it was always Doctor Who's the one constant that I found was the, I know things are bad today, but I've got Doctor Who. That's the one thing that I've got. It can be mine. I know there's lots of fans out there, but to me, it's, it's my thing. Um, so being able to continue that, being able to, especially shut off from the world with audio, I think is something that I'd never experienced before when it, until Big Finish. And the way that the stories are sort of told and acted, it's, it's such, you can just close your eyes and just forget about everything just for that hour. Um, so I think on behalf of sort of everybody in the group, I just want to say thank you for what you've brought to that and what you've brought to us when it comes to your stories. Well, that's really kind and good wishes to everybody and keep on listening because there's no point in us doing it uh, unless we have people who listen and give themselves to the stories. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, stories are incredibly important in every asset of life, in recovery, in guidance. Um, the lovely charity that I am honoured to be their patron of have a lovely phrase as their motto, which is um, changing lives one story at a time. And um, for me, that, that says it all. You can, if you start to share a story with somebody, you create a bond that can make you a better person. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Great. But thank you. Thank you.